Hello, everybody. Welcome back for the fifth and final lecture. Glad you all stuck around. So uh, in the last lecture, we started looking at algorithms which we can find useful in a distributed setting. In this lecture, we're going to continue on that tack, but focus on algorithms that are structured over graphs. So we're going to start with a brief example, uh, take a digression into how to represent graphs in a MapReduce setting. Uh, then we're going to analyze uh, two algorithms and how we would uh, formulate them in a parallel manner. Uh, first, uh, single source shortest path uh, through breadth first search. And then second, we're going to do page rank. So the motivating concepts over graph computations are that when we have data that's organized as a graph, we have some amount of computation that we want to do at each node. And um, each node will then contain a set of edges that move the computation to other nearby nodes. And so our computation must walk across the graph to perform the smaller calculations at each step. So the real question is, how do we actually traverse a graph in MapReduce when we don't have any sort of communication uh, between the mappers? And also, what would be a uh, good representation for a graph in this setting? So to do this, we're going to discuss uh, breadth-first search. Um, breadth-first search and depth-first search are obviously the two basic ways uh, to move through a graph. The reason that breadth-first search is better than depth-first search is because we don't have to do any backtracking uh, with this algorithm. We can just keep moving our frontier forward, uh, as is shown in this diagram here. If we start at the origin node in the upper left, we can see successively wider frontiers away from our origin node. And obviously, we don't want to go backwards after we've already processed some nodes. So whereas this node actually has a back edge into the third frontier, we're going to ignore those sorts of edges when we encounter them. So like I said, there are two major problems with formulating breadth-first search in a MapReduce world. And the first thing is that we don't really fit into MapReduce uh, in the first place. Uh, because once we have some nodes, then we can't just keep the mapper going on them because all the data that the mapper can use was given to it in uh, one shot at the beginning. So the way that we actually have to do this is by iterate passes through the MapReduce. We actually run the mapper, run the reducer, and then those results get fed back into a non-parallelized component that will then reinitiate another pass through MapReduce on different data. And the second problem is that sending the entire graph to a single mapper would incur an enormous amount of memory and bandwidth costs. In particular, we have to make sure that individual mappers are only receiving small fragments of the graph, uh, because obviously duplicating a graph that is any measurable percentage of, say, the World Wide Web would quickly uh, dominate all of the available bandwidth. So we have to really carefully consider how we're going to actually represent the graph. So graphs normally look something like this. They com are comprised of several individual discrete objects which hold references to the other nodes in the graph. And those references are used directly as edges. If we were to look at this as source code in a language like Java, uh, we would see something like the code on the right. And this has a nice benefit in that the structure is inherent in the object, but there are a few problems with this. First of all, there's no notion of iteration through the graph. If we want to iterate over the nodes in some sequential order, we would have to then thread a linked list through, uh, as with the iter next pointer in the, in the data structure, which adds to the memory required. More problematically, though, is that because these are direct references, they're based on memory addresses, which means that individual mappers would need to have a common view of the address space. And uh, this would require us to develop an entirely different layer, which would have addresses that are uh, globally identified throughout several mappers. And MapReduce doesn't really support any notion like this. So what we would have to do is find some way to serialize that data. And there isn't really an intuitive way to serialize a whole graph of this form. Fortunately, we can use different representations, such as an adjacency matrix. And an adjacency matrix is a pretty simple concept. We've enumerated all of the nodes, so we've assigned some identifier, uh, in this case, 1 through 4, 
to each node. And then for each uh, element in this two-dimensional grid, a 1 would represent a link uh, from a node to another one, and a 0 implies that there is no link. So here, for example, we can see that node 2 has a link to node 1. Uh, and node 1 does not have a link to node 3, because it's a 0. Another nice property of the matrix uh, representation is because we've already performed the enumeration step, iteration is just naturally encompassed in this. You can just move down the rows or across the columns. But of course, sending entire adjacency matrices along is going to be still a huge amount of data. So we would still like to compress this data into a more reasonable size. So we can make the observation that most rows of this graph are going to overwhelmingly hold zeros in any really large graph. Um, and because this is uh, Google and we are focused on web applications, the graph that would be most naturally representing would be the web itself and the link graph. And 99.999% of web pages do not link to one another. They would only have uh, a few particular edges. So a sparse matrix representation would simply discard all of the zero elements. And for each row, we would just in include a list of all of the elements that were non-zero. And of course, observing again that we only have two values, zero and one, we can just throw out all the ones and just record the column numbers uh, where the one would exist. So to actually use breadth-first search, we're going to want to compute something with it. So an interesting problem to consider is how can we uh, perform the single sort shortest path problem? How do we figure out the length of the shortest path from some target node, represented here by the light green node at the top, uh, which is curiously similar to the blue nodes on the screen, uh, all the way down to the pink node at the bottom, which would represent the target? Uh, as a byproduct of this algorithm, we're actually going to receive the shortest paths to every other node that we encounter on the way. Uh, and we could do this for a whole family of targets from this one source. Now, we commonly do this with an algorithm called Dijkstra's algorithm. However, Dijkstra's algorithm has a couple problems. First of all, it would involve manipulating a table of path lengths that would have to be shared between all the nodes. That in and of itself is not insurmountable uh, because we could probably do this with a clever reduce. However, Dijkstra's algorithm also means that at each time step, we only look at the shortest path we have so far, whereas that doesn't really exploit the power of the parallel system we have available. As long as we have n different machines, we might as well just try n different paths at a time. So the question is, can we, re can we reformulate this in terms of breadth-first search? So intuitively, it's going to look something like this. At each iteration, we're going to start from the origin node and grow the frontier of available nodes out by one level. The distance to the start node is obviously set at 0, and everything directly one edge away is 1. And then for all nodes that are further away, we take the minimum distance that we can find in that step to that node and set that to uh, be that node's distance that we encounter. So, S here represents the set of nodes that are available out from some node, and the distance to uh, that, I'm sorry, S represents the set of nodes that point to some node N, and the distance to N is the minimum distance to some node in that set from the origin plus one. So the key concept for parallelization is that we're not going to send the entire adjacency matrix to a mapper. Each mapper only needs to receive a single row describing who can be, re be reached from some node that we already know about. So for each map task, we're going to give it as the key the node that it is processing, as well as the current distance to that key, to that node, and a list of everybody that it points to, one row of our sparse adjacency matrix. Then for each of these points that we can see from this node, we emit those node names as a key, as well as d plus 1. The reduce task is then going to receive all of these distances together and select the minimum node. So to show this very briefly on the board, if we have some node here, which is visible three steps away, and we have a node here that's visible four steps away, 
and they both point to this common node, which we'll call P, this would emit P comma 4, this would emit P comma 5, and the reducer would select 4 as the minimum and write that there. Because this is now an output key, our non-parallelized part of the application will then pick this key up and move that row through the next iteration of the MapReduce set. And that would allow us to obviously check any out edges down here, and hopefully the target would be somewhere below them. So a single MapReduce task is going to advance the known frontier by one hop. And to perform the entire breadth-first search, as I said, we're going to be feeding this back into a non-parallelized component. The problem, however, is that at each time, we lose the points to list. So if we wanted to have this entirely contained in a set of maps and reduces, you could actually have each node emit to itself the points to list. The reducer would then collect the points to list and would be able to feed this directly back into the daisy chain. If we wanted to keep this optimized, uh, we would not end up doing this step. We'd write a more clever non-parallel component that would reinsert the points to list from the matrix to cut down from bandwidth. So an interesting property of the iterated sequence is that not all of the iterations through MapReduce are going to take the same amount of effort. Uh, the first pass, for example, is obviously only going to know about the origin node. So it's going to happen very quickly, just one map, one reduce, done. Uh, however, the subsequent iterations are going to get much wider very quickly because each frontier is going to be successively larger. So it's reasonable to wonder whether we're actually going to terminate with the algorithm as written. But eventually we're going to see that we're going to find nodes with only shorter and shorter paths, and we're not going to recycle things through if uh, we don't actually see our distances falling. So, for each, so to help with this, for each node in the graph, in addition to emitting the distances to everybody that we point to, you also just re-emit the current distance to yourself. That ensures that the current distance is still preserved as a potential candidate to be the minimum distance to the given node. That's what's going to keep back edges from uh, continually updating our set of known path lengths. So once we have this algorithm working, actually adding in edge weights is really pretty trivial. Instead of just adding one for each distance, we keep with our points to list the weight associated with each edge. And then we just emit d plus the weight with that edge as opposed to d plus one. And this algorithm will work for any positive weighted pa uh, graph. Much like with Dijkstra's algorithm, however, this does not handle negative cycles, so negative edge weights are uh, disallowed in this form. So how do we actually compare to Dijkstra's algorithm, since Dijkstra's algorithm is known to be fast? Dijkstra's algorithm is actually more efficient in terms of order of complexity, because at any time step, it only examines the, the minimum path that it can see at the current frontier. The MapReduce task, on the other hand, is going to just send out a computation along every path that it can see. So in that regard, it's actually an order of n more work. But because we have n machines, then this isn't actually taking any more time. It's just taking more time times machines. And for the case where all the weights are equal to 1, then we're actually going to have a factor of n speed up, because the Dijkstra's algorithm would have to uh, spend n steps at the same frontier before proceeding, whereas we can handle the entire frontier at one pass. Any final questions about uh, the shortest path algorithm? Cool. So then let's talk about another algorithm well known here at Google, PageRank. PageRank is effectively a measure of usefulness associated with a web page. And what it asks is, if a user starts at a random web page, they have two options. They can click a link that will take them to another web page, or they can just go to the search bar, they can go to the URL bar in their browser and type in a whole new URL. And if they continue to perform these two actions and never hit the back button, what are the odds that they're going to land on a given page? The intuition with searching is that 
the higher probability that you would ordinarily land on this page is probably the higher probability that you would actually want to see that in your search results. So to explain this visually, we have this graph representing the web, and each element of the graph has edges leading out of it, which represent links, and edges into it, which are links from elsewhere. And the more links that you have, the larger your page is. So sites like Wikipedia, the New York Times, uh, have a lot of links into them, which PageRank asserts to mean that that page is more useful. Therefore, pages that are linked to by one of those sites then get a higher boost than if they were only linked to by a smaller web page. And having more links into yourself continues to boost you, but having more links out of yourself actually diminishes the import that you give to any particular node that you can see. And this is captured with the formula that they put into the paper, uh, also shown on the screen. So what this actually means is, to calculate the page rank of some page that we're going to call A, we have to collect all of the pages that would link to A, which we call the T sub I's. We then take the page rank that each T sub I has, and we're going to break it into an equal number of fragments so that it can distribute those to its link E's. And C of P is the cardinality of the page, the number of pages that it has to dole a fragment of its page rank to. So for page A, we take the fragment of page, of page T1's rank that is owed to us, we take the fragment of page T2, and we sum all of those together. And that becomes our new page rank after we put in a boost uh, for this random jump factor, D. So D is this tunable parameter that encapsulates uh, the probability at which a, a user is going to just enter a new URL and give up clinking li links. And they said in the paper that they usually set this to about 0.85. So with 85% probability, we're going to click a link. With 15% probability, we're going to just uh, jump someplace else. So this algorithm now raises a bunch of issues that we have to consider. First of all, we've seen this as an iterative algorithm. Page rank at time step i plus 1 is based on the page rank values at time step i. So if we're going to be performing an iterated calculation, we would like it to converge on a final set of values. And it's reasonable to ask whether this is actually the case. And to answer this first question, it does not actually necessarily reach a particular fixed point in bounded time. So we cannot necessarily say that in order of n steps, it's actually going to re reach a set of values that then reduce to the same values on the next pass. However, within reasonable time, it's been empirically shown that this algorithm will converge to within a few percent of the final values. Uh, so you can run PageRank for a few hours, and then after that, you will have something that is within some bounded percent, like, say, 5% of uh, the actual targets, which works well enough. That having been said, convergence is probably uh, particular to the values that you choose for your variables, and specifically d. It's obvious that if we set this all the way to 0, then that means that with 0% of probability, we're going to click a link, meaning we're always going to enter a random URL. We can see that this will necessarily converge very quickly, because every page is going to have uniform probability that we'd hit it if we would just randomly type something in. Uh, that having been said, if we set it all the way to 1, it's interesting to consider what would happen, because then we would never enter random URLs. So pages that uh, are very far off the graph would have extraordinarily low page rank values and might not get picked up by our engine at all. So the final question, of course, is how would we actually encode this in an algorithm that we can use in a parallel setting? So this isn't actually how to do it parallel, but for intuition's sake, uh, let's take this. You make two tables, one containing the current page rank of every page and one containing the next rank. And we would seed the current pay rank with whatever values we wanted for time step 0, because with an iterated algorithm, we clearly need some base case. We would then iterate down our adjacency matrix and over all pages in the graph. And we can then distribute the page rank from the, people that link to a, from the pages that link to a given page into the next field for that row. We then copy next into current, 
initialize ourselves a fresh table for next and either check for convergence uh, and write it out to disk if we get within whatever factor we want, or we then go back to the iteration step and try again. And so we'd like to parallelize the steps outlined on the previous slide, and there are a few key insights again that allow this to happen. First of all, the next table depends on current, but not on any other rows of next. That suggests to us that mappers do not need to interact with one another after they've all received their initial values. Furthermore, we observe that individual rows of the adjacency matrix can again be processed in parallel. As long as we know everybody who links to a given page, which is encap encapsulated in one row, we don't need to consider any other rows uh, when performing one page rank calculation. And finally, we again observe that rows in a sparse matrix tend to be a relatively small amount of bandwidth. So as a, consequence, our encoding, as a consequence of this, our encoding is going to be as follows. We map each row of the current list to a list of page rank fragments that we assign to link E's. In each mapper, we do the step where we break apart the current page rank and push it out. The reducer will then take all of those fragments that went into a given page and sum them together and fix it up with the value of D. And again, as I mentioned, uh, because our graph is a binary graph, we don't actually need to transmit any values for it, simply the locations where there is a link. So graphically, page rank would look something like this. We have a set of three initial pages that we are going to break apart in our first mapper. And the page rank of a page is encoded here as the width of the bar up top. For each of the linkies, then, from one of those pages, we break apart the page rank that we have and tag it with the intermediate key of the page that that page rank fragment is going to. The reducer step would then shuffle these around so that the pages that are the same will then get summed together uh, to find the final page rank for that page. And obviously, after this aggregation is completed, we would then send it back up to the top again for another iteration through. So let's go through the exact MapReduce steps in a bit more detail. First of all, as Sierra mentioned yesterday, the first thing you have to do is clean up your data. Not terrifically interesting, but still, again, necessary. This is very straightforward in MapReduce because we can send uh, pages and their URLs directly into mappers. We would then run a program over them which uh, searches the pages for their individual links and would emit the uh, initial adjacency matrix out as the first set of values. Also, in this step is where we're going to actually pull our initial page ranks uh, from some database somewhere else and tag particularly interesting pages with these initial values. Most pages will probably wind up with a zero, but for interesting sites like CNN, Wikipedia, et cetera, we would actually give it some non-zero starting value so that authority can be pushed out. And the reducer from this step is just going to be the identity function. So now again, as I said, the mapper is going to be performing the, uh, the breaking up of a page rank fragment. So whereas this is how we aggregate data into A, our mapper is only going to be emitting this value for all pages for which that page is the T. It doesn't care about uh, the A quite just yet. So the uh, length of the URL list is the cardinality of the current page, or C of P in the previous slide. And uh, current rank is obviously the current page rank uh, at this iteration. And once again, just like in the iterated breadth-first search example, we can thread our uh, graph through an iterated series by emitting the URL list back to ourselves uh, at each step. The reducer is then going to get the URL list for the page where it is the page itself, as well as a series of uh, small pieces of page rank over cardinality. It then sums the piece over cardinality, fixes up with whatever global value of D that we had probably hard-coded into our application, and emits uh, a value that looks just like the input back to the map step. And this represents, obviously, the current value. So to finish up, if we wanted to have some notion of convergence, we would have to use a non-parallelizable component 
that would analyze the output of all of the reducers for this. We can do this with a fixed number of iterations. You could potentially, uh, you could potentially save the previous values and use some sort of distance metric. And if we're done, then we write it out to disk and ring the bell. Otherwise, again, we just initiate another map reducer. So one final point to, yes, question? The question is, is the number of mappers equal to the number of nodes in the graph? And the answer is yes. Which is huge. Which is huge. Right, which brings me into my next, uh, my next point that I was going to make, which is a slight caveat that this isn't actually how they do it here at Google. Unfortunately, this algorithm doesn't actually scale up to the entire web. That having been said, it will run over pretty large corpuses. Uh, for example, this can be implemented on top of all of Wikipedia, which has about 2 million pages in it. So we can look at a 2 million by 2 million matrix uh, with a relatively reasonable number of nodes, like 50 uh, machines. Um, this wouldn't expand indefinitely to uh, you know, 20 billion or however many web pages there are, but uh, it still does pretty far. Question in the back. The question is, could I parallelize the convergence testing step by simply memoizing the old and the new page ranks for a page and testing there? Well, that would give you the convergence, yes or no, for a given page. However, you would then still have to send all of those back to a single reducer, uh, which could be encoded as a sort of cheap map reduce. But at the same time, we would only have one reducer that all of the data is being funneled into. So it's not actually getting parallelized at that time. We just have a million votes for yes and a million votes for no. Another question. Could we use some sort of probabilistic method to test convergence faster? Could we use a probabilistic method to test convergence faster? Uh, I'm sure we could. <laughs> So the question is, then, if we only selected some percentage of those, could we test for convergence that way? That's certainly a very good metric um, to re-explain for everybody else that they didn't hear. Um, you would have that reduce pass, such as was suggested over there, where we check the old and the new values for a given page. And then you could emit these with two different keys, either actually check or ignore. Uh, the ignore ones would then get thrown into the bit bucket, and the actually check would only represent, say, 5 or 10% of the pages. And that would certainly cut the bandwidth down to whatever percentage of confidence you wanted. Um, but your accuracy would, again, uh, suffer as, as a result. I'm sure if you wanted to do this and had probably preceded with a list of important pages to check for convergence, that would actually probably be a relatively good heuristic. Um, that had been said, I don't really know how well this would work in practice. But good, good suggestion. So to conclude, formulating problems over graphs in terms of MapReduce is actually kind of tricky. MapReduce itself doesn't really have any notion of recursion built into it, which is sort of inherently captured as we expand through frontiers of a graph or any other sort of iterated computation. But we can still, help, we can still use it to help us run with all of our heavy lifting. The key element in parallelizing page rank is that we can process individual page ranks for a page without needing to look at the current page rank of any other page. The key element with breadth-first search is that we can select a single row of this graph to explore for a given mapper. And so with each of these, that means that we can narrowly focus the amount of data that we need to push out to given mappers, which allows us to parallelize over uh, these huge data sets. And so while it doesn't really work for internet-sized graphs, it will still work for uh, relatively intermediate-sized graphs in the neighborhood of 5 to 50 gigabytes. And so that concludes today's algorithms lecture. Uh, thank you all for staying through the series. I hope you learned something. <laughs> Any final questions? In the front.
Question is, how do you know when you are finished with the shortest path algorithm? Uh, how many iterations would that require? Uh, effectively, it would require a number of iterations equal to the diameter of the graph, or the length of the largest uh, possible path through the graph, um, which could be really huge for runaway chains. Uh, but for most graphs, um, the diameter doesn't tend to be very, very big. Right, so, we, so he said that it might be more than the diameter of the graph. Uh, I suppose then I'd claim it would be bounded by twice the diameter, because it's impossible to like, keep spiraling indefinitely. You'd be able to get down and then back, right? Um, I have to think about it. Um, I don't really know for certain. Um, yeah. n squared at worst, I'd say. Uh, probably, probably better. Any more? Anybody from the video conference sites? Do we have them? Hello? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yep, OK. A uh, question from the paper is when does the, the uh, page rank uh, add up like a probability so that all the page ranks would add up to one? But it seems like you need to divide through the the random factor, the one minus c thing, by the number of pages, or else you'll get some astronomical number as well. Is that right, or am I missing something? I had actually had the same had thought, had myself. The thought myself. Uh, when, I, when I read the paper. Uh, I'm honestly not sure how that works, because, right, it would suggest that if we set d to 0.85, then everything would be a minimum of 0.15 page rank, which, uh, as long as we've got more than eight pages in the web, would clearly exceed one. Uh, so I don't really know. You'd probably have to divide by n. Yes. Good. Any others? Thank you all for coming.